Hi everybody, I'm Cynthia Garrett and welcome to another session and I am really super excited about this week and next week because we're gonna spend some time actually talking to a young woman that most of you know, especially our TBN audience. You guys have seen her on Praise the Lords. You have seen her appear in studio a lot of times here at TBN. She's a real uh, family member here at the channel, but she's also a lovely and talented young woman of God. And, you know, my sort of theme, I guess, uh, for this show and, and the reason why God kind of laid her on my heart has everything to do with answering the question, how do we live out being in the world, but not of the world? You know, and if you look at Colossians and, and scriptures that actually talk about this, you really understand that, you know, there's a way to do this. And so I just have such a heart for young women and especially young guys out there who wonder, well, how can I live in the world but not be of the world? And so I think that my guest, Philippa Hanna, does a really great job of that. So I just am happy to welcome you in studio. I'm excited to be here. And have you on the couch? Yeah, it's I a didn't nice quite. Couch. Yes, and it is a new couch. Good. I'm glad you uh, yes. upgraded for me. It's a new couch. <laughs> We've debuted a new couch for this new season Excellent. of Sessions. And um, you're five albums in, yeah. right? Your fifth album is called Speed of Light. That's right. And I kind of thought I wanted the audience to meet you in a way maybe that they haven't met you before. But I do think when you're out on the road, a lot of people get to meet you through your songs. Yeah. Well, I sort of think that one of the challenges that I have generally as an artist is that what I do out on the road, it sort of stays out on the road. It's like Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like when I get in front of a live audience... She's not talking about sin. Snap out of it. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. No, um, <laughs> basically, when I, when I go out on the road to sing and play, um, I, I always, nearly always share my story from pretty much from beginning to present day. Um, and obviously when we're doing a short TV slot or a radio or anything like that, you just don't have the chance to do that. So it's really interesting because I'm, what I do most of the time, people don't, don't actually see unless they come and see me live. Okay, this is exciting. So what we're gonna do is actually journey through your songs. And mm -hmm. you know, when we were sitting here um, getting ready, you were fidgeting around with the song and I asked on set, well, what album is that from? What album was that from? And apparently it's something new. Yes. And uh, it's- Not on any albums. Yes. Right. It's called Off the Wagon. Off the Wagon. And right. I'm kind of thinking, for some reason, it's going to be the place that we start and the place that we land at the end of all of okay. this. So why the song? What's the significance of it? Well, the song actually came to me. I'd been in a Sunday morning service at a local church, and the pastor was talking about how we all daily have things that we perhaps disappoint ourselves in. You know, we start off the day with great intentions and then sometimes we say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. Um, and that, that's everyone. And that's why it's so great that God's mercies are new every day. And, and that's why we need each other because I think a big part of what we do for each other is, is re-rail one another. Yeah. And you know, that, that's such, you know, if we see someone that's fallen, that's someone that's hurting, that's someone that's struggling, you know, it's our place to, to pull them back up, you know? It could be any one of us. Did your so, husband do that for you? I'd like to think we do it for each other, yeah. um, but certainly, I mean, for me, it's it's insecurity. That's probably my the wagon that I fall off quite a lot is is insecurity. Oh, that's a wagon a lot of people yeah. fall off of. Yeah, and it's so easy to to just start to have this dialogue that's completely, it's completely the opposite to what you know in your heart. You know, when you just sort of start giving yourself grief in the mirror and deciding still to this day what you want to change. And I think you know, my husband is very good at speaking the truth to me, sort of talking sense into me in those moments, if you like. Yeah. You want to play some? I'd yeah. I'd love to hear some of this. Sure. This is off the wagon. So what, I guess what some of the audience won't know about me is that I, my, my background is, my dad is kind of a country singer. So he's Irish and his whole family grew up in caravans, touring Ireland and playing folk music and country music and Irish music. So I, I think for some reason, just for this particular song, I just, I drew on my country roots. Definitely got a country vibe. Yeah, so my, my dad likes this one. <laughs> I am thankful for my freedom. I've been lifted from fear and shame. I was taken from a life I didn't want, but it's so easy to forget how far I came. Now I'm on the road 
to glory. I got my ticket for heaven's train. But if I'm weary, cause the road is really dragging, and if I fall off the wagon, won't you put me right back on? Keep on driving, keep on driving, all the way to beautiful horizons. Keep on I just, I just got a prophetic word for you. I would take it. Come on, I, I, wow. That this is crazy because this where this has not happened to me since I have done this show. Wow. You are meant to sing country music when you get to America, and I heard Carrie Underwood look out. Ah, oh, wow. Carrie, if you're watching, I'm a big fan. Yeah. And I totally respect your legacy. Me, me too. But <laughs> but man. I, yeah, I'm willing to you know take a challenge. <laughs> I just saw a whole audience receive you and a door open for you that actually has everything to do with your country roots. It's kind of so weird because I never, obviously never set out to do that, but so many people have said to me, especially when I do mainstream tours, mm -hmm. they're like, you like your little Yorkshire Dolly Parton, you know. <laughs> I love it, so, that's a good thing. I like it. That's a good thing. Hey, maybe that's my elevator pitch. The, the Yorkshire Dolly Parton. You have to share that with them. You, you, yeah, you have to share that with yeah, them. Yeah, so <laughs> I've been going backwards and forwards to the States and talking to record labels. And for me, the whole process has been really interesting because for the first time, I'm having people ask me, who are you? You know, what do we put in the bio? What do we tell the radio stations? What is your elevator pitch? Which is, how do you describe yourself from the time it takes to go from the first floor to the, to the penthouse? Yeah. Um, and I'm just really not very good at doing that because... I just, I've never been very good at pigeonholing what I do. I just really kind of go with the flow. Yeah, you know something too? I don't think any of God's kids are really good at explaining themselves in a nutshell because in all honesty, if in beginning God created, mm. right? And he did. Then how unique and amazing and wonderfully complex and full and abundant are we his kids? Right. You know, so. I yeah. have a song for that if you like. You got a song for that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, What's yeah. it called? So this is one of the songs that I guess people know me for the most these days. And uh, again... I, I Am Amazing? No. No? What's this one called? The other one. The other one that's about that stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a song called Raggedy Doll. This is you Raggedy You heard Doll. about this one? Yeah. So this literally came to me when I was walking to Asda. Um, <laughs> and I was just... I was thinking about a lot of different things, but... I just had this picture in my mind of a, of a rag doll mm. that didn't like itself, you know? Mm. A rag doll that sort of spent all its time on the shelf wishing it could be anything but a rag doll. And comparing itself with the other toys, comparing itself with the Barbie doll, the action hero. And then I just had these, these words just come sort of into my spirit from the point of view of the toy maker and the affection, you know, that the toy maker has for everything he creates. So, you wanna hear a bit of this one? Yeah, I do. So this is Raggedy Doll. I've always wanted a friend like you Someone I could tell my secrets to And I would hold you all of the time Just because you're mine And I could paint your face in a million ways With cherry lips so that you could taste all the sweet kisses I could blow your way Each and every day Cause you were beautifully And I wouldn't change a thing I loved you from the day I brought you home I loved you since the day that you were sown Every stage, every seed of you It's just how I dreamed of you So I want the whole wide world to know I love you from your head down to your toes I love you from your head down to your toes My raggedy doll Whoa, whoa, whoa My raggedy doll I love it. You actually, from what I understand, impact a lot of young women um, on some of the secular tours that you've been on with that song. Yeah, with this song and, and a few others. And this is the interesting thing about, because when you opened up in the intro talking about being in the world and not of it, the, the way this has all panned out, I never intended to do this. So some people ask me questions like, why the mainstream or why Christian music? And, and the answer is I, I, I chose neither. I just... 
I became a Christian in 2004 and I picked up the guitar for the first time um, and I began to write my journey. Mm. And because I'd come from a mainstream background and seen how powerful songs communicate with people of all backgrounds, just what an amazing tool they are. Um, some people say like the backstage pass to people's hearts. And I just thought, well, that, that's the power of a song. I want to write songs people can relate to. So it really just ended up happening on its own, really. So what did you choose to, like, what did you think you were going to do if you weren't going to do this? I was going to give up music because it was, it was painful. Yeah. Because that's where I'd come from. So up until the point that I became a Christian, I was pursuing a career in mainstream music because that was my background. My dad was a country singer, as I said. Uh, my, my brother was bass player in a huge world famous band called Jamiroquai and Really? Yeah. Oh, I know Jamiroquai. Yeah, you probably know my brother, actually. Get out of town. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was probably on VH1 at the time that they were really, really big. Yeah, I mean, wow. and he's phenomenal. Ah. And then I had other family members that were doing really well in country music and things like that. So I just grew up with this, you know, it was like the family trade music. And so I, w I pursued it from a really young age and it wasn't working out and it was painful. And a lot of those things like going to auditions and, f and experiencing rejection and comparison. Um, I, I was giving up music because it was it was hurt, hurting me. So, but then I became a Christian, and it was like this new song started to rise up in me. And wow, that's a great way of putting it. A new song started to rise up in you. What was it like when you became a Christian? What was the moment like when you chose? Okay, Jesus is for me. Well, I have a song for that. Ah. <laughs> no, I um, love it. <laughs> This is actually not my song, so you might have to get clearance for it. But <laughs> um, so what happened was, I was I'd been sort of hanging out with some Christians in music events, mm -hmm. so things like open mic events and stuff. There was one open mic event in Preston that I used to go to every Tuesday, and I used to sing, you know, whatever song. And then I met this Christian. His name was Rue, still a good friend of mine, and he began to sort of witness to me, and I was extremely envious of his just his glow and his, his love of life, his hope for the future, because I think life was beginning to take its toll on me. You know, there was, I had some family problems, some relationship issues. Um, and so this guy, Rue, was just like, he's just like a little ray of sunshine. And, and he took me to his church, and then I met all these other rays of sunshine and realized that they were like a club I might be able to join. <laughs> um, no, seriously though, he took me to a worship event one evening and a guy called Godfrey Bertel was leading. And I was just so impacted by the atmosphere and the message of, uh, of this song. I can play a little bit of this one. Yeah. You might know this one. It, it just really spoke to me as a, a lost person. <laughs> My troubled soul, why so weighed down? You want me to bear this heavy Cast all your burdens upon the Lord Cause Jesus cares, he cares for you Jesus cares, he cares for you And all your worrying won't help you make it through So cast all your burdens upon the Lord of his love. done the way that you're doing it and it's absolutely my favorite. Well I've only ever heard the person who sung it that night do the song. You're kidding me? Yeah um, but then so he, the second verse was all about anxiety and what a lot of people didn't know and certainly not the Christians around me was that I was struggling with debilitating anxiety. Mm. I'd been to the doctors, I'd been on medication for it, I'd been it'd been something I'd struggled with since childhood. Mm. 
Um, you don't always realise these things at the time, but I was, I was such an anxious child, even to the point of now, looking back, it's very obvious I had some obsessive compulsive behaviours as a child and it carried on through adolescence. And so I was so burnt in by anxiety. And so they played this second verse about anxiety and then in true evangelical style, they kept playing that verse like over and over again. Wow. Um, so you got prophetically It felt, too. I felt so powerfully almost afraid. There was such a strong presence in the room and it felt like, okay, I brought you here. This is your moment. And so I, I responded and I just said, well, Jesus, if this is not my imagination and you're real and you're real like these people say you're real, I, I need a new start. I really need to be a new creation. They'd, I'd heard them talk about being a new creation and I just, in that moment, I, I kind of, I guess I got it and really wanted that for myself. So I prayed. And then from that moment, everything just began to change. Can you sing the verse about anxiety? Sure. Yeah. My anxious heart, why so upset? In troubled times, are you so easily forget? Cast all your burdens upon the Lord. Cause Jesus cares, He cares for you. Jesus cares, He cares for you. And all your worry won't help you make it through. So cast all your burdens upon the Lord. Again in the promise of his love. It was like somebody knew. It was really like, yeah. you know, in the Roberta Flack sense, it was like it was killing me softly. Yes. You know, it was. Oh, it was. Yeah, no, I get it because when the Lord took me deep into my next level of surrender, which literally started all of this in my life, um, I guess seven years ago now. It was because a, a young woman named Misty Edwards. Do you know who Misty is? I don't. Oh, gosh. Well, Misty, Misty honestly is probably responsible for the latest music movement to come out of America. That is really now even Bethel. Because at the International House of Prayer, IHOP, in Kansas City, she has been the um, head of the Forerunner Music Academy and runs the music ministry there. And she's trained up all these young artists. And uh, most of them are now, you know, Bethel artists. But Misty herself is insanely gifted. Like you, you know, really and truly could do whatever kind of music she wanted to. And um, Misty sings prophetically a lot of the time. And I sat in the prayer room one day and... Uh, I just heard this woman singing every note of my life and yeah. read, right? reading your mail. And I looked up and she was singing to me. And I, you know, I looked for months, literally about two months trying to find, I bought every album, every recording I could find of her, everything she'd ever done trying to find this song. And one day this guy in the bookstore said, he goes, you own everything by Misty Edwards. And I said, yeah, I'm trying to find this one song. And, blah. and, he, go, and he looked at me and he said, well, what was it? And I started kind of repeating some of it. And he started laughing. He goes, it's not a song. And I said, what do you mean? He said, she's saying prophetically to you. That was a gift from God. Wow. And, and that was the first time I think I really realized, and maybe it was the same moment for you with your music, because kind of leads me to my next question. But mm. for me, that's when I realized, like I always knew how powerful music was, but that's when I really realized how powerfully music could be used to bring people into a place before God yeah, and to change absolutely. their lives, you know? Yeah, I think, because music had always had this power for me, which was very spiritual and had led me out of dark places and it had been therapy for me. But in that particular moment, I suddenly realized, wow, it's almost like this is music that's connected to the source from which all music ever came. Right. Um, and so I remember the first time I led worship, it was, it was probably about six months after that. That, that moment and I was lucky and blessed enough that a pastor gave me the opportunity to lead in a, in a youth service. And my eyes were closed for the whole thing. I had no idea what was going on. Um, and I just remember opening my eyes and everybody's arms were raised and I just, I felt like this is, this is so much bigger than me, so much bigger than mm -hmm. anything I've ever known about music. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing a lyric uh, 
that says, uh, catch me up in your story, all my life for your glory, my God, my joy, my delight. But but it was the part about being caught up in mm. God's story. Wow, yeah. That really, it, it always speaks to me. I, I can't remember even the name of the worship song, but every time I hear it, it speaks to me. So you've got, um, moving along through the, the story of your life, there is a song you, you wrote um, called Happy In My Skin. Yeah. What's um, that about and why? Well, really interestingly, um, obviously my ongoing identity struggles because of having an ambition in the music industry and, and experiencing rejection and um, being objectified, you know, that just casual objectification of someone going, maybe you could change your look a little bit for this and, you know. Maybe you could become less of who you are yeah. so that I can understand you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. But also then, I actually wrote this song in Hong Kong um, and I was doing, a, I, was, I was helping do a bit of coaching on a girl band project. And it was amazing because these girls came from all over Asia, they were from really different cultural backgrounds. And it was, it actually came from me trying to help them express just being who they were and happy together and uh, just embracing their culture and their heritage. So it came from two places really. Oh, okay. Do you want to hear a bit of it? Yeah, I do. Okay. I do. So this one is another one that seems to work really well on these tours I've been doing. Sick and tired, the way it makes me feel. Trying to find a way to stand up from the crowd. I see myself in the mirror. I just want to deliver. Yeah, but everybody's got a certain expectation. I'm under pressure to be something I can be. But I believe that I'm worth it. And even if I'm not perfect, there's only one of me. I want to be happy in my skin. Even if it's not flawless. Want to show my true colors like every other girl. I want to be appreciated. You can leave it or take it. But I'm not going to fake it just to please the world. I want to be happy. about that song is because, and I know why it resonates with, with especially secular girls, because yeah. everyone is really searching to connect with identity. Oh yeah. Right? Totally. And, and, and the, the unease that it causes us in our skin to actually find our identity, which is rooted in Christ, and yeah. most people don't even know that. And so that's why you can be a powerful conduit of that, because you know it. I like the word conduit. Good word, Great. right? Yeah. Kind of makes you feel you're not, you know, you're connected and it flows through you. And especially in this world that actually focuses so much on actual skin perfection, you know, the, the Instagram beauty blogging world, where it's literally like, um, they're like, try and make yourself look completely flawless and poreless and, you know, ha eradicate anything that makes you look anything like human, look like a doll. Um, and so there's so much pressure and, and most of us, you know, we don't have perfect skin. We don't, we don't, we're not perfect. No, you know, it was interesting. Yeah, it's very, I, I, I have a lot of um, empathy for your generation because you guys are in the middle of, I mean, it, it's naturally uncomfortable for us to have to think social media, mm. excuse me, but you guys, this is like the world that you're in and I can't, I mean, what's the negative about it? What's positive about it in your perspective? The positive about it is the connectivity of regular ordinary people to reach out and, and be quite inspiring to millions. And there's a, there's a great power in that, you know, to think that uh, bloggers like Zoella that have got, I don't know, 11 million subscribers and the fact that they, they're able to connect with so many people is, is empowering. Um, the negative, I think, is potentially also how isolating that is, you know, yeah. because we all end up living our lives through through our YouTube account and, and like watching and consuming and, yeah. you know, I do believe social media has some, has some real positives and yeah. I try and post on social media every day. I try and post something inspiring, always trying to look to those outside of church as well as those in, trying to connect them together. Um, but so that's great. But then the, the negative is that then in order to get to the good stuff, you also have to 
could be exposed to so much negative stuff. Uh, it's true. It's true. I think, though, that you have a real blessing in that your husband, Joel, I don't, I, I don't know how many people know this. I, I'm sure most of your fans know this, is also your drummer. He is. And it's, it's yeah. yeah, and it's a bit of protection, I think, while you're out there on the road and in the world, mm. to have kind of someone who covers you in that way and protect, kind of can sh help you shield out the madness of social media and of opinions yeah. and, and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's super important. We're, we're a tight team and Joel's a pastor's kid. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when we first met, it was very interesting because he sort of showed an interest in me, you know, and I politely tried to dissuade him because I just thought, <laughs> you know, I've just literally arrived in this Christian world and I know that you've, you know, you've been raised in a, a church going household and you've got certain, you've sort you know, he was just extremely unspoiled. Um, so I just felt like, you know, am I even good enough for this guy? But he, he straight away put me in my place and was like, you're a new creation. And, and I've prayed about it and it's fine. <laughs> so, and so we, we dated for four years and, and then- Oh, we, so did my husband and I. Really? Yeah, most people don't have that story. Yeah. That's like four years. I know, four years. Okay, so did you have a lot of sort of, uh, okay, so one of my favorite scriptures is, be ye continually transformed by the renewing yeah. of your mind in Christ Jesus. Did you have a lot of mind renewal to go through to actually begin to be able to be ready to be married? Oh yeah, and I'm still going through it. Me too. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean like for the first, for the first two years of being married, I think I don't realize, I didn't think I realized I could actually call Joel if I needed help. Because totally. I'd gotten used to being independent and not being, like, I didn't want to put him off because <laughs> like, I needed him too much. Right. So now we've, I'm getting much better at being a team, you know, and being one. I, I get that. I get that. It's nice, it's nice to sit here with someone else who gets that journey because mm -hmm. sometimes you really feel like, well, especially in this world where everybody seems to have everything so squirted out. I mean, not really, you know that we're, you know that we know that that's not true, but it certainly looks that way. And you can feel kind of lonely, like, does anybody else still have anything else to sort out and understand about being married and how to be married? Because I was single for so long also. And you do get your mind. You're yeah. just, it's different. You get conditioned differently. We're going to take, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back with more Philippa, but we're out of time for this session. We're just getting started. So make sure that you get a little bit of sleep in between this week and next week, because I promise it's, it's gonna get even better. We'll be back. I'm Cynthia Garrett with Philippa Hanna. We'll see you next week. Wow, I hope you're loving this session. I am, and I hope to see you next week for the conclusion of this session. But for now, I wanted to actually remind you to pick up a copy of Prodigal Daughter, A Journey Home to Identity, which is my first book. I gotta tell you, the concepts of spiritual warfare are all throughout this book. And I get to go into a lot more detail and a lot more explanation than I actually can in just a mini session. But I really think it'll bless you in overcoming the challenges that come against your life, your day, your family, your home, your marriage, your self-esteem, your values, your relationship with Christ, all of it, all of it. So I'll leave you with this. You can find it everywhere, um, online at retail sellers and in some bookstores. I hope it'll bless you. I am Cynthia Garrett. I will see you next week.